so thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to tell you what I do. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to tell you about the best separable state problem. A little bit about myself. I am a postdoc in Avi's group. I generally work on theoretical computer science. So today, this talk is going to be about an algorithmic problem. And uh, the motivations, actually, at least the main motivation comes from quantum information. Um, so what I'm going to do now is like tell you in one minute <laughs> what the motivation is, like in a very, very high level, brief, non-understandable way. And then basically go to a problem which is essentially understandable in a standalone setting, and, and hopefully will make sense. So the problem that I'm going to tell you about uh, is, is basically uh, it, it comes from the application of certifying measurement matrices in uh, quantum bipartite systems. Um, you want to basically certify that the measurement matrix accepts only certain states, which, certain states which have enough entanglement. So you somehow want to certify that a measurement matrix, for in particular, does not accept any separable state, any, any state which doesn't have enough entanglement. So somehow this leads to an algorithmic problem. If you wanted to do it with, let's say, a classical computer, it leads to an algorithmic problem that I'm going to discuss today. So, um, but somewhat surprisingly, and this is sort of a five-year-old connection by now, uh, best separable state and like related problems in quantum information have actually led to uh, connections in classical computational complexity. And that's sort of my standpoint. That's how I got into it. So in particular, problems related to resolving the unique games conjecture, if you know what that is, uh, somehow fall into uh, uh, this category of related questions to this, this, this problem. And very recently, in fact, and that's sort of what I'm going to tell you a little bit about today, the result that I'm going to tell you about is going to, be, uh, is going to build on some recent breakthrough in another notorious conjecture in uh, computational complexity, especially the subfield of communication complexity, called as a log rank conjecture. If all of those terms are like foreign to you, you can totally ignore this slide, and I'm going to tell you something which should make sense without all of this. OK, so the problem, as I said, is really simple. What I want to do is the following, OK? So I'm going to give you a linear subspace of n by n matrices over the reals, OK? So you can imagine that I describe the subspace to you by giving a basis for it. So I give you some n by n matrices, and I'm interested in the span of them. Okay. Now your job is to find me unit vectors x and y in n dimensions, such that if I take the rank 1 matrix defined by them, then it lives in the subspace w that is given to you. Okay. So let me restate it in a different formulation now. You have like two different subsets of n by n matrices. The first one is fixed for the whole like for different instances of this problem, is the manifold of rank one matrices in n by n space, n by n dimensions. The other is basically input to your problem, which is a linear subspace W specified by giving it spaces. Okay? Now, finding a point in the intersection of two nice subsets of whatever, Euclidean space, is not really a foreign problem at all. We have seen several instances of it. In particular, if you set satisfy nice properties, we have standard technology that will be able to find like a point in the intersection. For example, if these sets happen to be convex, then you know we could, and they had some nice description, then we could apply like standard convex optimization machinery to solve this problem. Our trouble here is like one of the sets that we are given is of course very nice, it's a linear subspace. The other, on the other hand, is like nonlinear, non-convex, and you know, it's it's a very nice to describe set, but it doesn't have these nice properties that make it algorithmically tractable. So in particular, as I assume like almost all of you are aware of, this set of all rank 1 matrices can be thought of as basically set of, uh, you know, this, uh, a, a set of all solutions to a system of quadratic equations. So if you think of you know, each variable, uh, 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 each, each entry of an n by n matrix as a variable, then write down the equation that say that the determinant of any 2 by 2 minor is 0. The set of all non-zero matrices that satisfy this are basically rank one matrices. Okay, so the problem here is to find an intersection between this non-linear rank one manifold and linear subspace W that is given to you. Okay, now one thing I want to mention is that this choice of basis is like super important. If you could choose the basis, of course the problem is trivial. <laughs> yeah. So you know, if if uh, if there was a rank one matrix in this subspace, you know, you will just choose a basis where one of the elements is rank one and you're done. But of course, the problem uh, is about uh, you know, taking an arbitrary basis of a linear subspace, where, for example, each element is very high rank. And you still want to find, let's say, a point in the linear combination, which is specified by coefficient c1, c2 up to cr, such that if I take the linear combination sum ci, bi, then it forms a you know, appropriately normalized rank 1 matrix. OK? Right, uh, I'm going to come to that. That's a very good question. Yes, so robustness and like how you depend on the error parameter is very important. I'm going to get to that. Okay, so, but before going to that, 
as I said, like this question is about finding a, a, a point in the span of this given matrices, which is rank 1. Okay? And again, I can basically state it as a, a, a problem of finding an, a, a solution to a system of quadratic equations. Okay? So you know, just to spell it out here, x and y are unit vectors. So some xi square is some, xi, some yi square is 1. And then these equations are quadratic equations in your variables, x1 through xn and y1 through yn, and state that xy transpose should be equal to some cibi. OK? Good. So now um, uh, I want to uh, address uh, the issue that. Back sorry. Yes. So, uh, yes. Okay. So the b's are just, oh, they're. Oh. They're input. They are given to you. They're fixed uh, things that you get as input. Okay. And you want to find the ci's and x and y which satisfy these quadratic equations. Okay. Any other questions before I move on? OK, good. So uh, but as Peter suggested, uh, we also want to sort of slightly generalize this problem and like consider a slightly more robust version. In this version, by the way, this, this image is obviously completely just uh, illustrative. It has nothing to do with this manifold that I'm looking at. I'm pretty sure it doesn't look like this. But, but uh, you know, hopefully, it tells you that it's nonlinear and that is linear. And that's basically all my attempt here. So. Um, OK, so, so in this uh, slightly more general version, uh, you know, the subspace uh, need not intersect the rank 1 manifold. And in this case, you are interested in finding a point in this manifold, which is as close as possible to the subspace. Again, the distance metric I'm going to use is the Euclidean metric on the n by n matrix space. So that is just the hilbert schmidt of the matrix or the Frobenius of the matrix, whatever is you know, familiar with you. Great, so, so hopefully the problem is now uh, all clear. And uh, as I said, this is going to be about a, a inventing a fast enough algorithm for this problem. So let me tell you a trivial algorithm for this problem to begin with, and then see what our benchmarks are. They're going to be pretty low, as you'll observe. So um, here is a trivial algorithm for this problem. Take uh, you know, the set of all unit vectors and take you know, appropriate some discretization of them. So take an epsilon net in the space of all unit vectors in n dimensions. Go over all pairs of vectors in this set and try to find out if the rank 1 matrix defined by them is close to the subspace w. Now, given the rank 1 matrix, finding out if it is close to a subspace is like very easy to solve problem, so which means that you, know, you can solve this problem in, the num in, in, in roughly the number of steps, which is proportional to you know, the number of pairs in the discretization set that you chose. This is going to be an algorithm that runs in time 2 to the O of n, and this is going to be our benchmark. We want to beat this, OK? <laughs> All right. So once uh, you know of a trivial algorithm, I'm going to now tell you about a non-trivial uh, algorithm. And you know, like many of you maybe do not care that much about uh, you know, algorithmic aspects of such problems. But let me remind you, or at least let me just uh, observe the following, that an algorithmic question can be a proxy to basically discovering important uh, uh, non-trivial structure uh, you know, in the kind of sets you're looking at. So hopefully, if you like these sets, then somehow the algorithm will have to exploit some nice fact, ni nice property, nice structure in this, in this manifold. And hopefully that structure will be interesting to you, even if like the algorithm itself is not. Okay, okay. So now I can state uh, the result with all that defense laid in. <laughs> so this is joint work with Boaz Barak and David Strider. This. Uh, so what we proved last year was that if you are given any collection of uh, n by n matrices, b1, b2, up to b small r, so this is supposed to be a basis for the subspace. So they can be of arbitrary rank. Then in two to the root n time. I'll be able to find unit vectors x and y, such that the rank 1 matrix x, y transpose defined by them is going to be close with respect to the hilbert schmidt metric to the subspace w defined by this b1, b2 up to b small r. Okay? So as I said, 2 to the O of n was your benchmark. This is a non-trivial algorithm. And I'm not going to try to convince you why 2 to the root n is interesting, etc. Instead, I, what I'm going to tell you in the next few minutes is what is the property of this rank 1 manifold that lets us do this slightly non-trivial update on this trivial algorithm that I talked about before. OK? Wait. There isn't such a thing as output, so there isn't Say it again? You're looking for something which you need to Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, so uh, you know, um, uh, perhaps like a clearer way to say it would be that if there is such a thing, then it would find it. Otherwise, it would return that there is nothing. The yeah, it will give the correct answer. Yes. Great. So uh, OK, so now I'm going to tell you about uh, what is the structural fact about rank 1 matrices that we actually use to prove this theorem. So I'm going to call it the structure theorem for rank 1 matrices. So it's going to be some structural fact about this space that is not true for general n by n matrices. So here's the claim. Suppose you have an arbitrary collection of capital N 
small n by small n dimensional matrices, which are all rank 1. And suppose they're all normalized to have their Frobenius or Hilbert-Schmidt norm set to 1. Okay? And this can be a completely arbitrary collection. And just you know, to, to sort of uh, uh, get your expectations right, I'm thinking of capital N, which is like really large. So you should think of capital N, which is like 2 to the O of n for this, for this result to make sense. The claim then is that there is a subset which is non-trivially large. So it has at least 2 to the minus root n fraction of the total uh, you know, number of elements in your set, such that the average of the matrices in this subcollection is going to be close to rank 1, a rank 1 matrix R, in again hilbert schmidt metric. Okay? So notice that if I take an arbitrary collection of rank 1 matrices, even small n of them, let's say like you chose them at random, then their sum is going to be very far from being rank 1. So this is not going to be true for a generic set of rank 1 matrices. Okay? In fact, our collection here, the collection of rank 1 matrices that I'm averaging, could be very large in size. As I said, it can be up to 2 to the root n in size. So this lemma or this theorem is still telling you that in any collection of capital N size, there is a way to choose a subcollection. Obviously, a generic way won't work, such that the average of these matrices will be close to a, a rank one matrix in Hilbert Schmidt norm. Okay? So, so that's that's what I call the, the structure theorem. So here is like a pictorial uh, uh, intuition, if if it makes sense. Let me try, let me try to you know explain this picture and hopefully it will make sense. So you know, every rank one matrix you can basically think of as a pair of unit vectors, the, the standard embedding of a rank one matrix. And you know, like your, your, your rank one matrices could now be completely spread out, like the x and y that define it could be completely spread out over the unit sphere in n dimensions. Okay? The lemma, therefore, the lemma is somehow saying that still you can somehow pick up a small enough cap. Okay? So this cap cannot be too small because there is no reason why any collection of matrices should live inside a small cap. But when you look at this cap and look at the, the vectors that live in this cap, they are spread out enough so that when you average them out, somehow only like you know the, the central direction stands out. So I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, if it doesn't, hopefully the theorem, the statement itself makes sense by itself. Sorry, so the collection S is comprised and be constructed out of vectors that are close to the cap. They're all individually close. So they cannot be, right? Like there is no reason for why a collection should live like that. But I'm telling you that there is a cap which is not going to be too large. It's going to be large enough that you can't force it for, gene for generic reasons, but it's, it's, it's not the only thing you can sort of assume, somehow show, is that the vectors that lie inside this cap, they have measure 2 to the minus root n. So this cap is, as, that's why the cap cannot be too small. But they're going to be spread out enough so that if you average them out, you know, like no single direction which is away from the center point will stand out. Okay, that's sort of the intuition. Anyway, so that's why, or that's, that's somehow some hand wavy explanation for why this uh, theorem could be true. That's the structure theorem. And um, the algorithm then follows by a somewhat standard technology of finding sum of squares representations for non-negative polynomials whenever they exist. There's a constructive uh, positive Selenzat which sort of allows you to do this. I'm basically throwing out buzzwords because in case you're interested, you can look these words up. I'm not trying to explain this. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's all. Thank you for your attention.